Now, this is my most asked question. Why do we need a bonding bushing on one side and not both sides if it's so important to be bonding the service? Why don't we have a bonding bushing inside the meter? I'm going to show you right now. If this is a hub to your disconnect and we have a properly threaded connection. Now, we're going to dig into this and this is going to be really insightful for you guys if you don't know the difference of threads and thread pitch in these because it's coming down the pipeline. Maybe not to your city now, but very soon. If this is our hub and we've got a solid connection, our meter's sitting on top of this. And even if we're on concentric or concentric knockouts, it doesn't matter because this is a hub. This is threaded in here. So this should be electrically connected. This should have electrical integrity from here to here. It should be a good connection. And then we're going to have threads that go into the top of our disconnect. The threads are bonded to the case where the grounds and neutrals are all bonded together. It's required to bond to the case at your service per the code. When we have a ground fault here, the current's going to get off of this pipe reliably and it's going to go through the screws to the case and we're bonding at the source. So we've made this established ground and the ground and the neutrals are all established together. We use our grounds to get current back to the neutral. So if we have a ground fault here and current gets on this metal nipple, because that's the whole point in bonding bushings and bonding at the service and bonding at 250 volts to ground and everything is to get current back to the neutral. That's ultimately what we're trying to do. We're trying to do it reliably. So the current's going to go off the ground wire. It's going to get onto the neutral, which is the source, which goes back to the meter anyway. So if we don't bond inside the meter, it doesn't matter. We bond reliably on one side and the current can still make its way back to the source. Now, let's look at these connections real quick because this is going to be really insightful. This, you can see, watch, watch how easy this is to uninstall. One, two, maybe, maybe two full turns to get that off. If we look at other connections, you can see where this is going to take multiple turns and it really just sails in there. The other one kind of stops. And I'm going to do it again, and you're going to see where we start to tighten this. And we're going to get one full turn there, get one more there, and then that's it. So we've got all these threads exposed. Is this ceiling from water entry? Gray area coming down your pipeline pretty soon. What do some municipalities have you do? Some are having you put a ceiling lock ring on the backside and then tightening it up against the hub. That way it can't get water in there. Also, these are good. This is a good product from Bridgeport. I like these. Back to bonding. What happens if we knock out our own hole and we're a service? So we should be a reliable hole. Everything's properly shouldered. The, the code book uses the verbiage shouldered itself. So we're properly shouldered. Uh, we should have everything that we need. Do we still need a bonding bushing? Answer is yes, because 250.92 says that your lock rings and everything must be listed for grounding and bonding. Is this lock ring listed for grounding and bonding? I don't know. It sure looks like it because this one has the ridges. We've all seen, and this one kind of has that, they kind of lean in where you can see where they might actually bite. This might actually be listed for grounding and bonding, but it's up to the electrician to be on site to show us the paperwork. If not, if you don't have a bonding bushing on your service and you don't have lock rings that are listed for grounding and bonding, well then, sorry buddy, you should have ran a bonding bushing on your service nipple. The service nipple is what we're trying to bond. We're trying to bond the raceway. So if the wire is missing, it's, you'd be surprised, but I've actually seen it with my own eyeballs. The wire is missing the insulation and it's just chilling inside of here. It will energize this nipple because there is no ground source. If we don't electrically bond back to the source, which is why I started with bonding at the neutral, if we're just tied to the meter, you're just going to energize the whole meter and the whole service mast because there is no reference to ground. If we reference this to ground and we bond our service nipple, well, now we can get back to the source to trip the breaker. So that's what it's all about. That applies to your meter can. It could apply to the gutter, the service raceways, the, the tap cam, whatever you're doing, you need to make sure that you're bonding and you really should be looking out for ceiling above live parts. 
Let's talk about why everybody thinks that you need to install bonding bushings on any knockout, whether it's eccentric or concentric, whatever it is. And that could not be further from the truth. I remember whenever I was an apprentice and I had a guy tell me, hey, did you know these were required on this air conditioner? Well, that's not exactly true because that air conditioner was only 208 volts. It wasn't 250 volts to ground. So you don't need bonding bushings inside of your disconnects, even if you have an eccentric or concentric knockout. These bonds are raceways. So if you're on a ground wire through a raceway and you need to make the raceway the same value or potential, you can use a bonding bushings on both sides. The code requires you to put bonding bushings on both sides of the raceway and you're going to attach this to the wire. And that way it's almost as if a raceway doesn't even exist. It's just your wire and your raceway are one and you're not going to create a magnet. If you guys were in fourth grade, you might've done the experiment where you wrapped a wire around a nail, tied it to a battery, and you turned the nail into a magnet because of the electromagnetic field. That's what can happen when you don't bond your raceways when you have a ground running through because there's always a trace amount, a small amount of current. It doesn't have to be dangerous current, but almost all your grounds, especially your main grounds, actually carry current. And, and it's not a problem. That's not objectable current. So there's always going to be a little bit of amount of current on your ground, on a building. Whenever I do infrared and I'd literally be laying inside of switch gears and I'd be hugging all of the wire because I had to run one test lead, one test lead up and through every individual black and then every individual red. And we might've had eight large pipes coming out with 600s on each one. I had to weave that in between each individual color times six pipes just to get the amperage of one phase for the whole group. And what we would do, would also do that for the grounds and we would see that they're pulling about one to two amps in a data center under normal conditions at all times. So do grounds carry current? Yes, especially when they're all bundled together where they originate at the source. That's where pretty much all the current is where they bond to the neutral. If you ran conduit out of a disconnect and it was 480, and it was properly shouldered and we're not a service, we have a gray area of the code where if the connection is properly shouldered, you may or may not have to prove that this is listed for grounding and bonding. So long as you're using all the listed fittings, you're running EMT and it's point to point. The second that you hit a concentric or concentric knockout, the, those connections are already seen as impaired connections. So it doesn't matter what you do. If you hit an eccentric or concentric knockout, and you're 250 volts to ground, you're going to have to put a bonding bushing because what you've attached to is effectively not even really connected to anything. And you need to put a bonding bushing, attach the wire to bond back to the case to get back to the source. So when we look at a 250 volts to ground situation, we didn't run into eccentric and eccentric knockouts and we knocked out our own hole. Typically, you're good to go. Now, Transformers are required to have flex because of flexibility and things like that. If you run to a transformer and we knocked out our own hole, there's a couple of requirements for flex that we need to look at. I might bring up the codes, but I'm just going to kind of tell you verbatim, maybe not in order, but basically less than 20 amps, less than six foot long and use the proper connections. Transformers are out of the question. Going to need a bond and bushing. Remember, we're trying to bond the raceway and we're trying to make sure the raceway is electrically connective so that we can get current back to the source. That's that's the name of the game here. Uh, you don't have any overcurrent protection right after the transformer. It's considered a secondary conductor, um, which is why you gotta have overcurrent protection. There you go. You may or may not be less than six feet or more. Doesn't matter. You've already not made one of those requirements. When you have 250 volts to ground and you're on an AC on a rooftop and you're doing an AC, Basically, you got to meet all four of the requirements. One, you got to be less than 20 amps. Next, you got to be less than six feet. You got to be less than an inch and a quarter size. And you also got to use listed connections. And let's say you are three quarter and you are required to have bonding bushings because you're, you're 250 volts ground. So you're like, do I need a bonding bushing? I'm three quarter. I'm a 20 amp unit. And I'm less than six feet. Do I need a bonding bushing? Did you hit a concentric knockout? Because if you did, follow the flow chart and you're going to see that eccentric and concentric knockouts are considered impaired. Now, if you want to knock out the side of the disconnect and you want to use listed fittings, you want to run four feet of three quarter flex and your AC unit happen to be 15 amps, we can have that conversation. But typically, everyone always runs through the eccentric and concentric knockouts. 
they're running flex that is metal that is likely to become energized it's able to become energized it's metal and the best thing to do in this case for a rooftop is just to run car flex it's plastic it's non-conductive you can save so much money and time one from not having to come back so if you don't have time to do it once you sure don't have time to do it twice and that's my whole thought on that so i hope this helps you guys out this is pretty much everything that you need to know about grounding and bonding where they're required where they're not required if you're not more than 250 volts to ground don't put a bonding bushing keep that money in your pocket follow the basic rules are you a service are you a transformer did you hit a concentric knockout if you're on a rooftop and you ran flex and it's metal chances are you need a bonding bushing on all parts of that disconnect so hopefully that helps you guys out and we'll see you guys in the next one